been with CareFlight for a long time, but um, just recently in January, almost a year now, I've been retired from full-time flight nursing and full-time work. Thank you. It, um, highly recommended. I would say, you know, if, if you have a chance to do that, do it. And you guys, if you can do that younger, retire. <laughs> so I'm teaching for them um, until the end of December this year doing some of this outreach teaching. I've done almost all of their new care flight orientations since I left. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they just have hired a new educator there. Her name's Deb, and I can't remember her last name because I haven't actually met her yet, but um, you'll be seeing a lot more of somebody else coming in here after this class. This will be my last one with you guys. I really like coming out here. This is my favorite place to teach. Anyway, um, last year I came in and taught about sepsis. We did a whole overview on pathophysiology and um, and kind of what the new things on the horizon were. So I thought we'd do an update this year and I got brand new data yesterday from Dr. Gonda from a course that he taught actually yesterday. He gave me all of his stuff. So I have updated information on some of the stuff we talked about last time. And kind of that, um, they don't have their data very well fleshed out at Renown going forward. They only go till well, sh well, I'll show you on the, on the uh, slide, but the middle of 2016 is the only stuff that they have actually plotted on graphs, but we'll kind of see where we are with one of the big hospitals in the area that is actually willing to share the information with us so we can teach it to EMS. So these are the things we're going to talk about today, kind of epidemiology, what patients are affected. We'll do a little on pathophys again, just like we did before, because it's good as a reminder. Every time I go through it, I learn a little bit more and remember a little bit more about why it is that sepsis is so overwhelming, I guess, and what body systems work against each other while they're trying to heal the body. Um, we'll talk about emerging research and hopeful treatment and some of the stuff that we did last year, we're going to talk about again. And then where are we today versus five years ago and what we as EMS can do to impact survival of these patients. It's a horrible mortality rate and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through here. So awareness is a big deal and this is still new. This is the stuff I showed you last year on the safe sepsis, stop sepsis with the, um, it's called the survive sepsis campaign. They do tons of research nationally and internationally on, you know, kind of what's going on. But this stuff is really something that's glaring to me. Awareness uh, of um, sepsis and what it is is pretty sad here in the U.S. So cases per 100,000 in the U.S., 223 of stroke, 208 of MIs. 22.8 of HIV, cancer's up there, almost as high as sepsis, but sepsis is number one. It's the number one thing in the U.S. that kills people. And, um, and this is a questionnaire that they send out every year. Have you heard of sepsis? And this is just to the general public. And in Germany, 50%, 46% in the U.S., 71% in Canada, and 93% in Brazil. Brazil. I mean, really? We don't think of that as being, you know, a first world country, but, you know, if you think about kind of how we manage um, healthcare education in this country, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty lax. Okay. So CDC st stats are essentially the same as last year. 1.5 um, million people in the U.S. have sepsis um, annually. 1.5 million. That's a lot of people, right? 250,000 of them die. A third of all hospital deaths are from sepsis, and 80% of septic patients come from pre-hospital. So we have a big stake in this as EMS providers and pre-hospital caregivers. We have, you know, we have the front line of being able to recognize first, and that's the biggest deal, is recognizing what's going on with the patients, and then making sure that the hospitals know what you think is going on. So those two things are really important. So basically, they say it varies among racial and ethnic groups, but it's highest in African American males. It's worse in the winter time, duh, right? People are sick in the winter time, so they get that, they get the initial insult from whatever illness they have. A lot of times it's flu. There isn't really a flu season anymore, kind of like there's no fire season anymore. It's year round. So make sure you get your flu shots. 
and keep up on them annually because you guys could be the one that has sepsis. I can tell you that I had a friend, and we'll talk a little bit about that, that died from flu, from having sepsis from the flu. Mostly older people, greater than 65 years of age, so about 85% of septic patients are th that group. Um, and if you think about it, you know, the boomers are over 65, most of them, 60-ish to 65 and older. And so that is a huge group of our society right now. And once they all die off, um, there will probably be less of an incidence um, just because of the age group, you know, the, the, the big balloon of older people, basically, that are out there. So mortality in the U.S., 750,000. Sepsis mortality rate, this is the new one, says it's down to 30%, but I would disagree with that. And this came from Dr. Gonda's stuff. I would disagree that it's down to 30% of patients with sepsis. Even their stats don't show that. And the annual cost of sepsis in U.S. hospitals is $20 billion. Now, that's down, though, from 2014, where it was $28 billion to take care of these patients. So sick, 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 sick. Readmission rates for sepsis is 12.2%, and the cost for septic patients for readmission is around $10,000 per visit. So that's going to be higher than heart failure, which is a big thing that we talk about a lot in EMS, you know, all the, um, all the, um, what do they call those things, where the, you know, the, yes, <laughs> the uh, community paramedics that are all out in all these different places and regions, their big focus is heart failure. Look at the difference. There's t twice as many readmissions come from sepsis has come from there. That's a really good place if you want to think about moving into the community health kind of a realm. If you guys ever get your staff up enough that you can do that or you want to do that. I mean that's one of those things that that is low hanging fruit right there to be able to get back and take care of those patients so they don't end up being readmitted to hospitals. And hospitals will pay you not to, to, to take care of those folks. Pneumonia readmission, 5%, COPD, 4.6, and heart attacks, 1.3%. So you can see of the things that we spend money on in this country, doing research for and taking care of patients for, um, is almost upside down from where it should be as far as cost goes. Cost versus funding. If you see sepsis is the most common disease, HIV is the lowest, they almost get, they do get the most funding. So HIV funding for research and care, treatment care, is the highest with the lowest population that's involved in it. So because it was such a big scary thing when it, you know, started blossoming up and there were a lot of patients involved with it that all died, um, Sepsis is just not well known, and we need to really focus on making sure that we, as healthcare providers, um, can get the word out that sepsis is, you know, something that we need to try and help fund sepsis research and care. So, what about the human cost? So, this is a picture. Those of you that were here last year saw this, and I started crying. I won't do it this year, I promise. This is a picture of a pilot I used to work with when I was flying over in California. His name's um, Matt Sarahina. He was 50 years old and he was adamantly not going to get a flu shot ever. I mean, we harassed and harangued and cajoled and did all that stuff with him, trying to get him to get his flu shot, and he refused. He works in EMS. He works in healthcare EMS, right? He's exposed to patients with bad, sick things going on. And he eventually got the flu, and he eventually got the pneumonia that follows the flu, and then he eventually died from sepsis. He was 51 years old. So it doesn't happen to just old people. It happens to young guys. This guy ran five miles every day. He was, uh, um, he was retired out of the Army. I mean, he was healthy, healthy, wonderful guy that now is gone. And, you know, it really becomes personal after you know somebody that has gone through it. Anybody here know somebody that's been septic and made it through it? Yeah? 
Yeah, I mean, it really becomes personal. So we need to really think about what we can do on our end of the spectrum. A lot of it we can't do, but there are things that we can do to make these patients a little bit safer and to get, um, to get them to health care earlier. And um, had he not waited so long, he probably would have been fine. He probably would have lived. Like most of us younger, not me, but you all, <laughs> younger um, folks that um, are healthy and work in health care, the last thing you want to do is go to the ER, right? Ever. He was the same way. He didn't want to go. That's his little wife, Lori. And his brothers. He was a uh, Hawaiian. So let's talk a little bit about cellular metabolism and how it kind of works in the body. And I know you guys remember this from when you went to medic school or EMT school. This is aerobic respiration of a cell. And so what happens, this is a sugar molecule. And with glycolysis, it gets cleaved into two. Two molecules there. And it, when it gets, when that reaction happens, it makes two ATPs. And ATP, remember, is the energy that, that is needed by cells to be able to um, uh, work efficiently. Then what happens is these two half, you know, um, elements go through the citric acid cycle, which is also called the Krebs cycle, if you're old like me. And from that, I mean, there's a whole lot that goes on in here. I'm not going to go through all of that because, first of all, I can't remember it all, and it really isn't all that applicable. But what else happens then is you get two more ATP. So out of glycolysis, this whole piece of it, you get four ATPs. Your body needs 38 to function normally. It's just got to have 38. So what the other 34 come from oxidative phosphorylation, which requires oxygen. So when we switch our patients from aerobic respiration with their cellular metabolism to anaerobic uh, respiration, they're only making these four ATP. This has to have oxygen. It's an electron transport chain, has to have oxygen to be able to give those 34 more ATP back to the cell. So what happens when we have our patients in an anaerobic state, so that means they're in shock, or they're hypoxic, or they have any of the things that our bad sick patients get, right? Acidosis will cause that. Any of that kind of stuff. Now their cells are trying to survive on a tiny bit of energy. So they're not going to work as efficiently, right? So what happens with pathophysiology of septic shock is it's associated with any kind of an inflammatory process. So what are some of the things you can think of that are inflammatory? This is where you participate. <laughs> Illness, right? They get sick. Lung disease is a good one. That's a very big one, actually. What else? Somebody else. I'll call on you. How about burns? Burns are super inflammatory, right? They cause a problem. What about just plain old trauma? That is another inflammatory process. There's a lot of things that happen um, that will cause you to have an inflammatory process. Anything that's infective, obviously. Burns, trauma, um, head bleeds, just spontaneous head bleeds. All the things that we see all the time in EMS can cause you to have an inflammatory response, which does good things, right? The inflammation is meant to be there to help you heal. So if you get a broken leg, inflammatory mediators bring more circulation to that area. They help knit the bones back together. They do all that stuff to fix it. In fact, when you have, if you have bone surgery, the, um, the orthopedic surgeon will tell you no ibuprofen, nothing that's an NSAID after you've had that surgery because we need that inflammatory process to build those bones back. So that's something that's helpful in our body. Inflammation isn't always bad. Really, oops, that's not what I meant to do. 
So basically it brings extra circulation to the area, kills bacteria, and, and kind of causes all the things to happen to kind of come to that area and fix it. It also releases catecholamines. And that's in response to vasodilation, right? So your body vasodilates from these um, mediators, these inflammatory mediators, vasodilate, bring more circulation to the area. Your catecholamines get released because they go, oh, what's going on? The blood pressure may have dropped, you know, maybe even two points. But that's what your body's mechanism does to try and fix problems with excess vasodilation. So now you've got increase cellular oxygen demand and particularly cardiac. So what's happening when you have increased catecholamines? <coughs> what happens inside the body? Yeah, you get a heart rate boost, you get a blood pressure boost, you get all of those things. So now what you're doing is you're increasing your oxygen demand. So sometimes, and especially in older folks, in 65 on up, they don't have the ability to um, handle that increased oxygen demand because they may have other things going on, comorbidities, right? So they got lung disease, they may have cardiac disease, they may have all these different things that are, you know, even high blood pressure. All these things that are kind of confounding and cause problems when you have uh, increased oxygen demand in your cells. So these are some of the other things that happen. So we have uh, increased unopposed nitric oxide, which is an inflammatory mediator, and it is, it has two sides of the, um, two sides that are good. Here's the pro side to those. So what it does, it is increases oxygen delivery to those ischemic tissues. That's kind of how it works, right? It increases macrophage activity. What do macrophages do? Yeah, they eat the bacteria or the cells that are filled with bacteria and um, viruses. So they kind of are the ones that, the little Pac-Man guys that go in there and clean up all the, all the dirty stuff. They reduce platelet ag aggregation. So what happens a lot of times when you have uh, nitric oxide um, is that you get a little bit of leaky capillaries, right? That's one of the things that happens with nitric oxide unopposed. And so when that happens, your platelets go, oh my God, they're bleeding somewhere. Let's run in there and fix that. And so then you have microemboli. So um, it does that. And then it increases free radical scavengers. So it's in there cleaning up some of the, you know, um, some of the free radicals that you don't really want in there, the bad ones, the bad free radicals. On the con side, however, it causes vasoplegia. And what does that word mean? Yeah, everything's just laying there loose, right? It can't contract the vasculature anymore. So vasoplegia is one of those things that is really bad um, that happens from this unopposed ni uh, nitric oxide. So it gives you an intrinsic vasopressin deficiency from renal failure. So we know what vasopressin does, right? We carry it in our bags and we give it to patients that need to have that stability of their vasculature, squeeze it down. And so then it causes a loss of suppression of oxi nitric oxide mediated venodilation. So you can see how it's good on one side and bad on the other. And especially for people that are already compromised, this is really bad. This, all this side stuff is really bad. <clears throat> so oxygen derived free radicals, they are released when the phagocytes get out. So there's a chat, your body gets this challenge and it says, okay, make me some phagocytes. I got somebody sick. And that's your immune response, basically. And so what happens then is these, these oxygen-free radicals get released, basically. And they're used by the body to eat the microbes, to kill them, right? And unfortunately, what they do is they make increased endothelial permeability. And so now you have leaky capillaries. Leaky capillaries cause you to third space. What does that do to your vascular blood pressure? Yeah, it drops it to the ground. That's why these patients super quickly get um, hypotensive and hypovolemic. 
because they have plenty of volume on board, but it's leaking out everywhere. Um, it inactivates antiproteases, which uh, causes injury to parenchymal cells. So what's a parenchymal cell? It's a working cell in, in, within each organ. So it, those are the things that actually do the work in the organs. So if you think about liver cells, those are the ones that are doing the filtration. If you think about kidney cells, same thing for them. If you think about cardiovascular cells, it, those are the ones that are actually doing the squeezing and working. It also kills red blood cells. The parenchyma of the red blood cell gets bl blasted apart. And so um, a lot of times with sepsis, they'll look at um, the patient's blood and they'll look at each cell individually. So they do a microscopic uh, look at the cells and they find a lot of them are lysed. So they're broken open. They can't carry any oxygen. So the oxygen these patients are getting is basically free floating in the air or in the blood, in the air, <laughs> in the blood. So there is that other problem with not being able to carry oxygen to these cells that are already deprived of oxygen and it causes further problems with having energy to the cells. The increased vascular permeability, like we already said, activates plate, platelets. It doesn't help anybody unless you're bleeding to death. It doesn't help you to have platelets aggregating all over the body. They cause microemboli. Those microemboli cause all kinds of problems, right? DIC. So now if you do stick a needle in this person, they may bleed really badly because they don't have, the platelets aren't, aren't going to the right place. They're all in these different little places cause, causing little aggregations. So you have to worry about DIC at that time because there's nothing that can mobilize to fix the bleeding. So it's a bad deal. Decreases the uh, flow because of decreased uh, lumen size from the microemboli. So you can see how everything is kind of working against itself, right? You've got these big fat vessels that can't constrict to work right. You've got microemboli in them that's making it hard for the blood pressure to push things around. You've got a blood pressure that's down because everything's leaking out. Whatever you guys put in or we put in that's IV fluids may help for a little bit, but may not work at all. So what else? It is the master of all types of shock. So when you have these patients, you can't just say, oh, well, it's this or it's that. It's all of them. Every, one, every type of shock that you know about is really in here. You've got the vasodistributive, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and cytotoxic. So even ones that we don't really think about very often, like cytotoxic, that's one of the things that actually is affected with these patients. So this is just a little bit of a picture of what happens with the vasodistributive. And normally we don't think about it being um, vasodistributive of being a medical thing. It's usually a trauma thing, right? That's the patients that have the severed cords and they have the bad head injuries and they lose their sympathetic tone. This is just what happens with nitric oxide, and there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on over here. Um, but basically what it does is it causes vasodilation, intervascular co coagulation, increased permeability, and blood cells actually can come out here as well and cause some hemorrhage into the, into the tissues. So it's just a picture of kind of what all is going on based on um, having just that inflammatory process going on. So hypovolemic shock, I mean, it makes sense, right? The patient's oral intake is decreased. They feel crappy, they're sick, they usually don't drink enough fluids, they may be febrile. If they have a fever, they need more fluids just to keep themselves on a normal balance, right? Um, and so, their oral intake is really important. Um, third spacing happens. So we've already talked about that leaky capillary thing. They third space out into their tissues. And, you know, it's pretty icky. 
Um, it's terrible to watch. Um, and then they have the increased insensible loss from their rapid respiratory rates. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is respiratory rate is the key indicator these days for sepsis. Somebody you think may have had an insult, has a high respiratory rate, always think sepsis on those guys. Unless you have something completely different that you know it is. So cardiogenic shock, and this is a picture of, um, so these are ventricles here, these are atria here. That's the right atria. Should it be bigger than the ventricles? No. This guy has dilated cardiomyopathy and CHF. And the reason it looks like that is because they have de depressed myocardial function, and then they get this biventricular and aortic um, hi global hypokinesis. So you guys know that that means that the cells are not, it's just not squeezing right. It's like it's, it's like the heart is sedated and it's just barely doing its job. It's not doing the whole big squeeze like that, it's squeezing like this. And hypokinesis you can see really clearly if you go into the cath lab on those patients that have MIs, you can see it on little part of a wall, a little area that's injured. When they have global hypokinesis, they can't push blood around very effectively. So that's a big deal, and cardiac failure is number two right after respiratory failure on these patients. So if you're looking at organs that go down kind of like dominoes, usually respiratory, then cardiac, and then they end up with renal and GI and all that, the other things that are a little bit further down the um, pecking order. Well, brain too. The brain is, I guess, number one. They all have ele elevated BNPs, so it makes people think, okay, maybe this person isn't septic. Maybe they have just congestive failure because they have cardiac problems, and so they're going down the wrong track a lot, and so be thinking about that. If you have a patient you're taking somewhere that has an elevated BNP and may have some other symptoms that make you think, even remotely, that they're septic, be thinking sepsis about, about these patients. So their BNPs can be clear up in the two, three, four thousands. So it's incredibly high, higher than patients in just regular congestive heart failure. Um, and survivors all show some chronic um, dysfunction down the road. So, yeah. Can you uh, remind us BNP? It's a binaturic... Uh, I don't know, I can't remember what it's called, but it is a marker that they use in cardiology to, to know whether or not the heart is too stretched and not working right. So it, the heart actually sends out this enzyme, the BNP en enzyme, um, and they measure that on anybody they worry may have any cardiac um, problems or, yeah. And it, they use it a lot to just diagnose um, congestive heart failure. So, but it's not real specific, and it can be bumped by a lot of things. So you can see a BNP bump on a patient that has a short spurt of hypertension, or you can see a BNP bump on a patient that has a real small, um, small episode of having um, hypotension. So, you know, what, for whatever reason, it's not real specifically specific, but it really shows up super high. And I think the high, the normal high is 500. Sometimes you see these patients in the two or three thousands with sepsis. Because they have, it's not just one little part of their heart that's having a problem, it's all of it. And the left ventricle is the one we care about the most, right? So obstructive shock. So why would you have obstructive shock? So this is normal. This is what it looks like in a normal patient. This is the right atrium. It goes into the pulmonary arteries, into the lungs. Comes back in the pulmonary veins into the heart after it's been oxygenated and then goes back out into the aorta. So what happens when patients have obstructive shock is for some reason they have constriction of their pulmonary arteries. Now, why do you think they would have, in sepsis, they'd have constriction of their pulmonary arteries? DIC? Could be inflammation, could be a DIC. Yes, that's a really common one, is that they have little microemboli in there, right? 
in the heart, it's or in the lungs themselves. So the pulmonary artery constricts trying to push that stuff in faster. Remember a blood pressure in the pulmonary artery is 25 over 15. So it's a wimpy little right side of your heart. The left side of your heart has can, you know, it can muster, you know, 160, 180 over whatever. And so you think about how the function works anyway. It's kind of going from a, not a very high volume or high pressure system, and you guys know pressure systems really well, into an area where it's a delta. So it goes out of that right side of the heart. It doesn't need a lot of pressure. To go into the pulmonary vasculature, it just kind of flows in there. There's lots of room for everything. It doesn't have to be a big push. But what happens when you have no return to the right side of the heart is the pulmonary arteries are trying to squeeze down as much as they can to, um, to, to get some kind of a pressure into that side of the lungs, or into the lungs. And remember, microemboli are a big piece of what's going on there. They may also have constriction of their pulmonary arteries. And that happens a lot with microemboli, and more often it happens once we start giving them drugs. So cytotoxic, that's when the mitochondria are in trouble. And the mitochondria is kind of the powerhouse of the cell, right? And that gets in trouble when they don't get enough food. They don't have enough energy to be able to produce things. And so it, you don't have that electron transport chain. They're running on four instead of 38. So if you think about how you would feel if you had a, you know, a blood sugar of 20 versus 80, that's kind of what's going on with these guys. So adrenal hormones release. So what's that? That's adrenaline. That's our own personal epinephrine. When that happens, it decreases mitochondrial activity. It signals to the mitochondria of the cell, hey, everyone conserve. Everybody slow down and conserve. We're in a crisis here when, you're, when your adrenals are running like that, right? And then it actually causes them to have this energy crisis in actual cell death. Once the cell dies, tissues die, and then the organ dies. And hopefully that's one of the things that we can prevent on our end is death from that. And what do you think our biggest thing that we can do to fix that in the pre-hospital is? Simplest thing we do, put patients on oxygen. Don't be afraid to put these kind of sick patients on oxygen. Remember, if they have a SpO2 of 100, does that mean that they are moving a lot of oxygen around? No, it means that that one hemoglobin that's in there is fully loaded. That's all it means. They may not have that much hemoglobin, and you can't really count on that to tell you that the patient's, you know, over-oxygenated or, I mean, I guess you can say if they're under oxygenated, but it doesn't give you a really clear picture. So don't withhold oxygen on these bad sick septic patients. Don't worry about doing 100% oxygen on them. The other thing we can do is give them lots of fluids. So let's talk about treatments. The number one outcome changer, and this has been in about a 14 year study that they've looked at, and they look at the data every year. The newest data that came out, I looked at a study yesterday, came out in June of 2018, and it was talking about how this really impacts um, uh, the outcome of patients, and that's getting antibiotics on board. Do you guys carry antibiotics? You should talk to your medical director of getting just one drug. If you, I mean, one antibiotic that you carry. Rocephin is cheap as dirt super easy to administer, and I'll talk about it specifically as we move forward a little bit, but if you can look at survival rates for these patients, within an hour of onset, 80, 78 to 80% of patients actually will survive. If you get up to five hours, um, they're down to 40. 12 hours later, 20%, and if it's 36 hours after the fact, these patients pretty much die. So anywhere, I mean, this is this is kind of the this is kind of the where these two things come together is kind of the place where um, 
you have to have antibiotics on board or their survival is, I mean, that's about 50% right there. So if that's one of the things that you guys could do to really make a difference in patients. I know a lot of your patients come local here, but if you're somewhere else and you end up having to take them to a different place, making sure you have antibiotics going is really important. Some of the places that we go or get patients from, um, even hospitals haven't started antibiotics on them yet because they're waiting for other things to be done. Like this thing, blood cultures. And if you look at the literature, they talk about this being best practice in the hospital. <laughs> and that's great if they can get them. Here's the problem. For us, they don't change any of the outcome. Everybody gets the same standard um, treatment the first 48 hours. Anyway, it takes that long for blood cultures to come back. So, I mean, getting antibiotics on board is way more important than getting blood cultures. Um, it, a lot of times they delay, delay, delay getting antibiotics on board because they're trying to get um, blood cultures on these patients. For us, in the pre-hospital environment, our samples are not that great. They always grow out skin flora. And that's because we don't spend five minutes scrubbing the site. And who wants to? <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I've been a nurse 42 years. I don't want to scrub a site. I don't care about that. It doesn't matter to me. What I want to do is the other side, is do the life-saving things. So don't worry about that. And if you get to a hospital that's getting ready to transport a patient, have you guys transport a patient to a different place because of ICU or whatever, make sure that you ask them for antibiotics to go. It's simple. It's simple to give. Can you guys give them if they're running? Yeah. They're easy. Oops. Wrong button. So Rosefin is broad Spectrum should have two grams initially in all adults. It's really easy to give. Peds 50 milligrams per kilo up to two grams. Um, it's mixed in 100 milliliters of saline and you can run it over 10 minutes. Do you need a pump for it? No. <laughs> all you have to do is run it over 10 minutes. I mean, really, it's simple as can be. It can be run concurrently with fluid boluses, it can be run with pressors, and like I said, it is dirt cheap. So you may want to. Um, you know, if your medical director wants to talk to somebody about it, ask them to call um, Jeremy Gonda, who's the medical director at CareFlight. He also is the head of the sepsis committee at Renown. He also works at St. Mary's in the ED and at Northern in the ED. So he doesn't have any one place that he's connected to. He does a lot of research on sepsis because it's really important to him. And so I think our ground guys have antibiotics they carry now too. So. IV fluids. Last year when I was here, I told you lactated ringer was the best. Well, they've done more research. So now it's back to saline. They, you know how they do. They go all the way through to just kind of, you know, they look at research and then they look at better research and then they look at more research and they find out that, that it's not so great. One of the things they find with lactated ringers, which is why you don't give it to infants as well, is that it'll cause these sick, sick septic patients to have hypochloremia. So they, um, it, it causes problems with them because it's a balanced saline. Normal saline is better. We all carry it. It's easy to use. Um, 30 milliliters per kilo, kilo of absolute body weight or ideal body weight. And so how do you figure out what their ideal body weight is? Yeah, you use a cheat sheet, right? <laughs> you use all of, your, all of your references that you can find to do that. But uh, there's lots of different ways. There's the ulnar bone length, which works pretty well. And I, I couldn't tell you what exactly it is. But if you look that up online, you can see that the ulnar length for absolute body weight is probably the most, um, the most uh, reliable. And it's easy to do. I mean, you can figure that out pretty quickly, how long somebody's ulna is versus how tall they are when they're lying on a bed. If you can figure out how tall they are, then it's, um, I'm trying to remember what it is. It's 50 kilos at five feet, and then for men, it's uh, 2.3 kilos per inch. And then for women, it's uh, 1.3 three kilos per inch, something like that. There are several different cheat sheets out there that all are real close in the same area. But most adult men should weigh about 70 kilos, and most adult women should weigh between 55 and 60 kilos. 
I need to be a little taller <laughs> for mine. So the important thing here is that it must be done in the first three to six hours of symptom on, onset. After, after between three and six hours, the capillaries are leaking like crazy and you will probably not catch up only doing fluid boluses. So if you can get fluids going really quickly on these patients and make sure you're giving them enough. And remember, if they have comorbidities like congestive heart failure, should you withhold fluids on them? No, these guys need it in their vasculature or they're going to die. So make sure that you, you, even though you are, you know, it's kind of ingrained in our brains, okay, be careful, let's give little fluid boluses and see how they do. If they're in congestive failure, it's probably likely from a different thing right now. They need that fluid, so make sure that you give them lots of that. Um, after that first period of time, that three to six hours, if you're giving them fluid boluses, they're going to die. You have an increased mortality rate for those folks because what they do is third space and, and they're not going to respond to it and then they have all this excess fluid. They look like the Michelin man. And I can attest to that. I was, uh, I had a, I was septic from a urinary tract infection about six years ago and that's before I was 60, by the way. <laughs> Back in the day when I was younger. And I can tell you that when I was discharged from the hospital, I gained 17 pounds of just fluid. Because they waited and they just kept giving me fluid, fluid, fluid instead of any pressors. And when I got discharged, I ended up back in the hospital the next day in congestive failure because I had so much of a fluid overload. My, you know, all of the stuff from my, uh, my girth was twice the size of my normal girth. And it was all just fluids. So increased mortality with fluid boluses after six hours. And so the way you know whether or not the patient, we don't know what, how long this has been going on, right? How do we know how long this has been going on? We don't. I mean, we go in someone's house and said, oh yeah, I've been sick for a couple days and last night they didn't want to eat dinner and then today they won't get out of bed and they're breathing real hard. And you're like, okay, great. So you don't know when the onset of that was. It might have been already six hours ago. How do you know if they're going to respond? And this is well documented in the stuff. We don't have tons of time to do this. But if you take a patient like that is in their normal, you know, head up 30 degrees and flip them, so you put their feet up, passively raise their feet and take their uh, blood pressure, it really does the same thing. Anybody here remember mass pants? All of us oldies remember mass pants. It does the same thing. It gives a little bolus of blood back to the central circulation. And if they're going to respond to um, IV fluids, they will get better with this, just with this. All you have to do is hold their feet up for about a minute, retake their blood pressure, and you will see a big difference in it. So if you have enough help to do that, it'll give you a good clue whether or not they're going to respond to all those fluids. The non-responders end up like this. I mean, look at that. That's sad. After the thir first three, six hours, they third space. This is congestive failure over here. This is just that pitting edema. And they have it everywhere. They'll end up with it in their backs, around their abdomen. You'll see it in their faces even. So that, that ends up being bad. After the first six hours, less IV fluid is more. And it's better for the patient. So what do we do for pressors? Epi, yes. Do you guys have norepi yet? That's another thing to ask for, specifically for sepsis. If you have these patients with sepsis, the nice thing that norepi doesn't do, that epi does, is it um, prevents the patient from having that reflex tachycardia that causes them to have more oxygen demand and more fluid demand, right? So all those things kind of play together. Norepi is the best. You do not ever want to use dopamine in sepsis. Sometimes kids will be on dopamine. Um, because how do they manage their blood pressure? Heart rate, right? They bring their heart rate up and that's how they manage it. If they can get their heart rate up, their blood pressure comes up. And that's why you see kids that are tachycardic for a long time when they're in shock, they do really well for a long time just being tachycardic, keeping their pressure up until they get something to help them with it. 
Dopamine has been proven to increase morbidity and mortality in pretty much every situation these days. So here's a hazard ratio. These are the things that dopamine is better for. Not hypovolemic, not cardiogenic, and not septic. <laughs> so dopamine has been taken off all the rigs in, in Washoe County. and not even carrying it anymore. Epi, we use a lot. And now the ground ambulance there has norepinephrine. So nor norepi, this is what the sepsis folks say is first line you should be using. Um, epinephrine or vasopressant sec second line. This is all. This has all come out in 2018. Uh, no dopamine, and then alternatives are going to be phenylephrine, and we use phenylephrine as a third line. So you know when you're doing critical care, you use that, then you use that, then you use phenylephrine, and dobutamine. If you have someone volume resuscitation that has a really low ejection fraction, so they're not pushing out any, any um, volume out of their left ventricle. The thing that works really well is dobutamine. And how dobutamine works is it reduces afterload. It doesn't reduce preload. So on that arterial side of the body, you know, from the left side of the, side of the heart, it causes some, vaso, or some arterial dilation. So that crappy little left ventricle that's wimpy and can't really squeeze very hard can now push blood against that, um, that problem that we have going on. And a lot of times you'll see patients on norepi, epi, phenyl, and dobutamine. So they kind of work almost opposite, but they work on different parts of the body. So they, um, they will augment each other. So the type of shocks that these things work for are going to be hypovolemic, vasodistributive, and cardiogenic. And then there's a new one. There's a new drug out, a new presser option. It's angiotensin II. And if you remember how the angiotensin system works, it's, it's driven by your renals that tell you that you, know, you need to have um, more, more pressure to make sure that they're getting enough uh, blood and oxygen. So angiotensin gets converted into angiotensin 2 and so they have this new option called geopreza or preza. And basically what they found is that it did increase 70 percent of the patients in, um, on angiotensin 2 uh, got a map of 75 or better and that's versus the 23 percent in the placebo group. So it's a pretty good chasm in between there. It works pretty well. I don't know that any of us in EMS are going to carry that in a s real soon <laughs> at $1,500 a dose. I mean, it's hard for us to think about spending $50 a dose on drugs, and, and $1,500 is probably going to be out. And just wait until next year when someone come and, comes and does your update. It'll be out for some reason anyway because it won't have worked well. So the new and exciting stuff is the merging therapy with vitamin C. They have one small study. And the reason that they have one small study is who is it that pays for drug research? Drug companies do. Well, we do it indirectly, right? Because in our country especially, we pay the highest price for med medications in the world. <laughs> I'm not sure why we have to do all the research, but we do. Um, so. They're not going to do um, a big research study based on vitamin C therapy because it doesn't cost anything. It's super cheap and they will never be able to make it expensive. So the jury's still out a year later. I told you this stuff last year, but the jury is still out. I can tell you that Renown has used the vitamin C therapy and I'll show you the Merrick study a little bit about it um, and how it, how it worked and what their... Um, their mortality rates are versus the conventional care that they're giving. So what happens with C is it's depleted in sepsis and that's one of the things that you and I should take every day even if you eat a good healthy diet you should still take supplemental vitamin C every day. It uh, maintains your endothelial integrity so if you end up in a position where you're sick it'll keep those capillaries from leaking so badly. Um, it's a cofactor in production of catecholamines, so you don't run out of your own normal catecholamines as easily 
is someone that doesn't have enough vitamin C. Um, it supports your adrenals, so it increases the production of cort cortisol, and then it increases your immune response. So it's one of those things that's really handy to have on board, and we are, most people in the U.S., if you were to just go randomly and have your vitamin C level checked, if you don't take supplements, you would find that it's probably a little low. So Dr. Paul Merrick, <laughs> Uh, two-year study ended in two, 2017 he thought you know I'm just gonna try this I'm seeing all these patients they're just dying um, conventional wisdom was to always give hydrocortisone he thought you know vitamin C sounds like a good idea and thiamine too and we'll talk about thiamine in a second but the traditional mortality rate is 40 percent his mortality rate is 8.5 percent so that's why quite a few little places are starting to do their own research within their facilities on patients and they're randomizing it and it's double blinded as to what the patients are getting and um, some of them are getting just conventional therapy and some of them are getting conventional therapy with this and um, the, so the jury's still out they're not there yet I want to show you a little video um, that one and I cut and pasted it so I couldn't. Sorry. I gotta do it this way. I, 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 I can't reliably get it to come up on other people's stuff. So I just do it here. So before we started this vitamin um, C protocol, we would have septic patients come in and they would have multiple comorbidities. They would be critically ill, they would be maxed out on several pressors, oh, um, antibiotics would be infused, blood cultures, etc. Um, we would basically be giving them life support. We would just go day after day. Um, their kidneys would get to the point that they would fail and we would have to do around the clock dialysis on them. And, I mean, they just weren't getting any better in any length of time. We'd come in, their pressures would be really low, uh, elevated heart rates, uh, just on death's door. That was kind of our situation beforehand, and um, it was pretty difficult. <laughs> Dr. Merrick came on in with his vitamin C protocol. Um, this binder of information and he wanted to start giving patients vitamin C infusions, steroids and other vitamins as well. I think a lot of us here were a little skeptical about uh, Dr. These are crusty started. old ICU well, nurses. Like a little else. skeptical? Some Probably some really sounds. skeptical. It just seemed too simple. <laughs> and remarkably our patients were getting better. We administered to early on to some of our patients and uh, they started to turn around quickly like within 12 hours. We thought it had to be a fluke. But then we started having patient after patient after patient that just had these remarkable results. They would be at death store, and 12 hours later, they would be like 50% better. 24 to 48 hours later, uh, we literally have seen patients walk out of here we did not think would leave. And now we're, we're still working hard, and we're seeing better outcomes, and we're not coming into work the next day, and our patient is passed away. It, it sounds unbelievable until you experience it. But once you do, sorry, I have to get goosebumps now just thinking about how these patients get so much better so quickly. So that's that's kind of the um, one of the reasons why they've um, made it a made it a study they're working on um, is because of those patients basically those kind of outcomes. And you know, if you see something like that, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt anybody. Why would you not at least try, right? And so that's kind of what they're doing right now. So thiamine, why thiamine? One of the things about thiamine is it's essential. Um, it's a cofactor for um, all your metabolic enzymes. Deficiency is really common. Thiamine doesn't stay in your body very long. It gets kind of cycled out. We are, as humans, are about it in the world. As, you know, as far as living things that don't manufacture our own thiamine. So we live at that point where we're mostly uh, vitamin 
deficient anyway with thiamine. Unless you eat a lot of the thiamine, you know, producing f foods. So things like um, raw wheat, um, what else is thiamine? Green leafy vegetables. I mean, all that stuff on a really regular basis, like daily, you end up having some thiamine deficiency. Um, the half-life is short, so that's the T one half there, that's, that means half-life. And so it, it can be life-threatening not to have enough thiamine on board. And we historically have not given that to any patients except our um, chronic alcoholic patients, right? You see the thiamine yellow bags hanging on those folks. And so they've started actually hanging a lot of the vitamin supplements. So they'll, they'll use almost like the yellow bag that you see hanging on those alcoholics. You'll see that um, with these bad, sick, critical patients in the ICU as well. Um, they don't know really why the lactate levels stay so high in these patients, but having this is super safe. We've used it for many, many years in patients that are, that are alcoholics. And so it really, um, it ends up being one of those things that might help and won't hurt. So let's try it anyway. Um, there's the study, and if you want to look that up, and if you're interested in looking at the actual Merrick study, there's all the information. I'll make sure you guys have this slide set so you can, you know, if you're interested in looking it up, you can find it. And so if you look at their, the patient's mortality, the predicted mortality is around 42 to 45 percent when he did the study, so the end of 2017, the control group, uh, or the actual mortality for the control group not getting the thiamine and vitamin C is right about a, about, you know, 1% lower. And then if you look at in his study with that treatment, predicted mortality is the same. And the patients that died, regardless of any treatment, are going to be here in the 10%, 8 to 10%. So this whole group you can kind of throw out. They're going to die anywhere, anyway. And this group right here at the very top, you can throw out. So the people in between this and this are the ones that we're going to be able to actually help if we're, if we're using some, something similar to this. So this is the group that was, um, this shows you how quickly that they got weaned off norepinephrine. And um, so the treatment group, these are the guys in the study, it started at um, 20 mics per minute. 30 mics per minute is the upper limit of what you're supposed to give. I mean, after 30, it really doesn't do anything except make their toes and fingers navy blue and have them have to have uh, amputations afterwards. So that's a problem. So they all started right around, you know, this one, the control group that lived, they started them a little lower, but they all ended up right in the 15 to 20 range at some point. And you can see the group that lived, this is the blue line went all the way up to about 15 and then slowly were weaned down at about 20 hours they were still at 7 or 8 and then at 30 hours they were down to probably 5 and by the time they got weaned off they they were about 45 hours in so that's a long time on pressors and we know that those kind of pressors cause problems with lots of ischemia um, peripherally as well as cardiac. So you have to really support the cardiac muscle while you're giving those drugs. And sometimes you have to give it with, believe it or not, um, uh, nitroglycerin so that you keep their coronaries open. So in the ICU setting, you may see patients like that that have those drugs going in and you're going, what? I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what are they thinking? Turn off that nitro. <laughs> But they're keeping their, their, you know, selectively keeping open their coronary arteries. And so the thing that's glaring, this is a group that's going to die anyway. They're the controlled dead group, and they're probably going to die no matter what. But you see that they went above 30 mics at, at about 10 hours. 
and they were all the way up to 40 mics when the person finally died. So they were, they were throwing the kitchen sink at the patient. They probably were on a bunch of other stuff too, but they never weaned them off because they were probably in that lower group that we know are going to die regardless, right? So these two things are the ones you want to look at. The, the ones that lived and the ones that got better quickly. These guys in the Merrick study were down to uh, about 5 at 10 hours and down to about 2 at 20 hours and off at 30 hours. So you can see there's a big chasm between those two things. And that their just predicted outcome because they're off the presser sooner is going to be much better. So the reason that we still aren't seeing this widespread is that they, they did not do a randomized clinical trial. There are are meta studies going on nationally now um, that multiple hospitals and they're um, they're all they have all the demographics involved so it's not just the small hospital in a small community where everybody's pretty much the same they have them across the different places so they have them in Dallas they have them going on in Seattle they're going on in San Francisco New York so all these places that have all kinds of different uh, patient uh, populations involved are um, involved in it at this time. And then they have uh, uh, no concurrent controls. Yeah, they have all the controls in place. They've set it up to be um, randomized. So we probably will have something within the next maybe 18 months that is conclusive, yes or no. And the reason that the hospitals are really waiting to see is everybody has gone to what's called evidence-based medicine and they don't want to do something that's not in a controlled study that's outside of the parameters of the evidence-based stuff that works currently. So surviving sepsis 2016 was rolled out in 17 and that's what we still have. There was a little tweak to it this year and basically what they do, did is before, so last year when they rolled out, 2017 in January when they rolled out this stuff, they said within three hours they need to get a lactate level, blood cultures, broad spectrum antibiotics, and then that 30 milliliters for anyone who has um, hypotension or a lactate level above 3.9, so four or, or better. And what they're saying now is their best practice and their goal is within an hour of hitting the doors of the ED. So that, I mean, that's a big step for them. You know how hospitals move. <laughs> it's slow sometimes, and recognition is slow. For those patients that you guys don't bring in, they may not have a good idea of recognition. You guys are going to get the best history of anybody that ends up in the hospital. And you're going to be able to see what's going on in their house and that kind of stuff. So that's why it's really key that you're involved in this. Within three to six hours, it used to be only six hours, they want vasopressors on board if they're not responding to their uh, fluid challenge. Um, and they need to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than 64. So 65 or better. 70 is kind of the goal. They'd like to see 70. Perfuses the brain better, perfuses the end organs better, and it'll reperfuse those things that already have issues, right? Those organs that have issues. Um, they're supposed to reassess volume status and tissue perfusion, and that's supposed to be done by a physician within six hours. Well, that doesn't hit the mark very often. Once in a while it does. And then remeasuring the lactate um, at six hours if um, it was initially elevated. Because now what you're doing is you're measuring, you're trending to see if you're actually resuscitating the patient or not. And if you're resuscitating them, their lactate should come down. So those are things to look at. So where are we at today? And this is just renowned statistics because they're willing to share those with us when we do this outside education. So sepsis care in RMC, and that looks like brain surgery, I know, but I'll point out kind of what's going on here. Lactid, lactic acid within three, so this is the beginning, 2014 in December, kind of how they've done this sort of up and down thing. They did pretty good here for a while and then um, and the last one they had is July 2016. Last year when I was here, the best they had to was February 2016. And I don't know what takes them so long to get this stuff, these stats pulled together, but I mean, it's 18, the end of 18. They should have at least 17s in there, I would think. Um, but we're, we're grateful for the information they do provide us. And, but, and really what this just kind of tells you is 
they're not hitting the mark on any of them. They're not 100%. They were 100% on this one, which is vasopressors within six hours of persistent hypotension. They were until here in July 2016, and they went from 100% across the board for, for almost a year and dropped down to 70%. What happens in July in hospitals? New doctors come, out of re come into residencies. So that's where, the, that's where the baby doctors have to be pushed and taught how to do things by the older doctors or the nursing staff. Also what happens in July is nursing students are getting their state boards. So they're finally passing their NCLEX exam. They're able to go into these places and they have, so July is a bad time to get sick or end up in the ICU, always. Because you have brand new doctors and you have nurses that have been there for a very short period of time and have probably just about finished their orientation as a new, new grad, but they don't necessarily, and they take them right into these ICUs. They don't necessarily have all of the pieces put together to push these new docs, so, or have the confidence to push these new docs to do what they need to do. So you will see, usually in July, it's not so great of a time. The one thing they did, see this year in July in the measures where lactic acid was um, initially assessed and that has to do with the ED. So the ED docs are a lot more you know pushing and they have um, they have standardized orders now for anybody that the triage nurse thinks has sepsis or it comes from the field with somebody saying the word sepsis on the radio I think this patient may be septic. They call it code septis, sepsis, and their first labs are all drawn within, you know, a few minutes of hitting the door. So that's kind of kind of how that, you know, shakes down. But they're not hitting their measures. These are the old measures too. There's nothing fancy about them. They've been going on for a long time, 2015, 16, and 17. Same things they're asking people to do, and they're still not hitting them. And I think a lot of that has to do with turnover and. You know, you guys know. You've seen them in the hospitals. So this gets us all the way up to July of 16, too, about their survival rates. Um, septic shock patients, they say they have a survival rate now of 32%. Uh, their sepsis severe, which they don't really recognize anymore, is down to around... 12% and then there are patients that have simple sepsis. They've actually gone from being at 4% up to about uh, what, six, seven, eight percent, something like that. So there's their simple sepsis has they have gotten worse at. Well we don't know, but by then they had gotten worse at. So so the newest recommendations have changed the definition. They've changed screening tools and then the management is a little bit different. Not much. So this is kind of the redefinition. There's no, no more severe sepsis category and that was as of January last year, 2017, not 2018. So these stats obviously are old so they'll probably take that thing out with their next stats that come up. Um, septic shock is defined by persistent persisting hyper, hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain their MAP and lactate that's greater than two despite volume resuscitation. The screening, the screening tools, and I talked about this last year, this is really the simplest and the most accurate of all the screening tools that they're using. And Dr. Glanda gave me another um, tip. He said, yes, this is what the hospital is asking pre-hospital people to think about using when they're looking at a patient in the pre-hospital setting. Um, alter alteration in mental status, so they're not completely with you. They don't have to be comatose or anything, but just altered a little bit. With a decreased systolic blood pressure of less than 100 and respiratory rate of 22 breaths a minute or more. So the most sensitive uh, organ we have in our brain to hypoxia is our, um, or in our body is hypoxia um, to the brain. So that's where you get that patient that has altered mental status. This is a better indicator because before they get hypoxic in their brain, they get tachypnic, right? And what's a normal respiratory rate for an adult? 
Yeah, 12 to 20. So, but most of us, I mean, what do you think your respiratory rate is just sitting here? It's probably, you know, 12 to 14. You're not exerting any energy right now. You're just kind of sitting here. Your heart rate's probably between 60 and 70. You don't have much demand. And so if you think about these kind of patients, as soon as their demand goes up, their respiratory rate goes up until it gets really bad. So that is your most sensitive indicator. And it, it came, it changed from, used to be when you're looking at um, SERS criteria and stuff, it was over 24. So now they're saying it's a little bit more sensitive. Adults shouldn't have a heart rate or a respiratory rate of 20 unless they're having anxiety, they got something else going on. And um, 22 breaths a minute has come down dramatically from what it was before. Any two of these should make you think that the patient's septic. Any two of those. You don't have to have all three. So if you have someone that's a little altered, has a high respiratory rate, and you know they're not, you know, hypoglycemic or something, you know they're not a diabetic hypoglycemic patient, then you want to think about them being septic. And then you start looking at all the other things that are going on with the patient, and you may come to that and these patients really, um, really, you guys are the front line. I mean, truly, you are. You're the folks that are going to be able to, you know, make a difference because the hospitals will take hours to diagnose it. And if you guys give them an inkling of the fact that the patient has sepsis, they're going to get on it much quicker. And mostly because they have recorded lines that you guys call in on and say that I think this patient may be septic. They don't want that liability of not working them up for sepsis right away. So they're going to be thinking about always, you know, getting on it and looking at it pretty quickly. So lots of research is going on still. It's totally outcomes based. Um, antibiotics, fluids, and early use suppressors are the front line of it now in maintaining their blood pressure. If they keep their blood pressure up, they will not have multiple organ dysfunction. They will not go into that place where they have First, they have you know respiratory failure, and they end up intubated, and then they have cardiac failure, and they end up you know on all kinds of drugs, and then they have you know renal failure, and then their gut fails, and it really leaks all kinds of toxins into their abdominal contents. So, you know those patients, if they can, if you can keep their blood pressure up, that is the best thing that you can do, and always just think of early, um, early lots of IV fluids. So here's that sofa. I don't know why they always put a picture of a sofa on it, I guess, because it, I don't know. But hypotension, less than 100, ultra metal status, tachypnea, and, um, and any of those two suggest that they're going to have a poor outcome and they need to be worked up for sepsis. So it's super simple to remember. So what's our role? Early, uh, lots of IV fluids early on, making sure that we, um, take care of those patients. So it's a 120 kilo patient, gets around three and a half liters. This is not ideal body weight, right? We're not talking about that for these guys. We're talking about absolute, I mean their normal body weight, absolute body weight. So fat people get more fluids than skinny people, right? And then early use suppressors and norepi is four milligrams in 250. Start at 2 to 30 mics per minute. Epi is a, a half a milligram and of the 1 to 1,000, so the stuff you give for anaphylaxis, in 500 milliliters and starts at 10 drops a minute for um, 1 mic per minute. And 1 to 4 is the normal dose for epi. And you got to keep their blood pressure up, managing oxygenation and hypoxia. You know, that's, that's got to be, those two things really have to tie together for you guys to be, be able to make a difference in their outcomes. Don't sedate them if you can help it. If they're hypoxic and confused and combative, that means they're hypoxic. So if you sedate these hypoxic patients and take away their, um, take away their sympathetic drive, that's when you see these patients just die in front of you. And so that's one of the reasons why, even with um, RSI, we don't, we don't give them any sedation at all. We may use ketamine because ketamine, you know, can bolster the blood pressure and doesn't mess with their sympathetic tone. 
um, and we may give them um, paralytics. They don't, they don't necessarily affect blood pressure either. So um, avoid sedating these patients and let them hyperventilate. If they're hyperventilating, if they're breathing 35 times a minute, don't try and slow them down. Give them adequate oxygen and just let them breathe that fast. What they're doing when they're hyperventilating is they're correcting their acidosis, right? They're doing that and they're hyperoxygenating what blood cells are working. So you really want them to hyperventilate. And if you have a patient like that, that you've picked up somewhere that's on a ventilator and you're taken somewhere and they have them in the low range of respiratory rate and they're sick, increase it to at least 20 for adults and at least 30 for kids. So you gotta make sure that they're hyperventilated because they will, they will get sicker and sicker and sicker on positive pressure ventilation if you don't uh, allow for hyperventilation. So the most important thing is just be clear and make sure that the hospital knows exactly what you think is going on with the patient. Don't be afraid to say, I think this patient's septic. They're shocky, they have had a history of whatever, and you know they have uh, tech apnea. And so that will give them the ability to call out code sepsis or whatever it is in the hospital you're taking them to. I don't know if CDMC has one or not, do they? have a code sepsis. I know a bunch of those nurses have come from Renown that work out here and they know about septic patients and they know about code sepsis and they know about what the idea is for getting that stuff turned around. So and don't be afraid of telling them that that's what you think is going on with the patient. So crushed by an alligator, there's a code for that. Yeah, whatever. Anybody have any questions about anything? Anything I, I can answer for you? Good, good. Good, thank you. Very welcome. And I'll make sure I share this with you guys so that if anyone wants to review it again or you know, fool with it or whatever, you can, you'll have it. All right. You're welcome, guys. Thank you. Before everybody takes off, uh,